everyone welcome to another podcast episode of the talk to rami show this is your host rami today i'm very excited because i have an amazing person here that we're going to talk about the power of storytelling and the effects of storytelling in your personal brand and the business bill harper is here he's a ceo and chief creative officer at wm harper an agency that they transform your business through your branding through storytelling is very powerful. We're going to talk about a lot of great things today. Please listen, and most importantly, make sure you do it. Bill, welcome to the show, my friend. Rami, thank you so much for having me. I've been excited about this. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go, man. Got my coffee. We're ready to go. Oh, yeah, yeah. How is your day so far? Off to a phenomenal start. That that's great. Let me, you know, everybody wants to know who is Bill Harper. Tell me, how did you get into this branding? And how, you are so <laughs> passionate. But I, I have watched your TikTok, man, and it's blowing up. And and you are so passionate to tell it exactly like what it is and how how it is. And how did you get into this line of work? What is your story? I, so it, yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of a mishmash, really. I started off with a whole bunch of interests when I was in high school. I was into engineering and electronics and theater and art and writing, and I just had all these different things. And I was trying to figure out what in the world I was going to do with them. And in the background, I'm a crazy sheet metal guy. Like I'm a, a massive <laughs> car fan, just huge. And I, it doesn't matter if I'm under the car working on it or if I'm you know looking at designs of cars. I don't care. Like there's not nearly enough time in my life to have all the cars that I've, that I've fallen in love with. And so I convinced myself that I was going to go to school to be an engineer. And my mom, I remember, was just shaking her head. She says, you're about as much of an engineer as I am a salt shaker. But if you want to go and you, you know, you could do it, go ahead. And I had the grades and I got in. And so I went to school for engineering and it took me about a semester to realize that I had no no business at all being an engineer. I didn't know, but it wasn't how I thought. It was very, very linear, but that was a phenomenal lesson because at some point, you know, I'd always aced everything that I had ever done in math. And so I like sauntered into this thing and I got crushed and I sat down with my professor and I, you know, I'd never gotten under like a 90 in a math class ever. I had no idea what that was. And he said, listen, I can tell by the kind of mistakes you're making that while you might be tenacious enough to become an engineer, you'll never be a good one. Wow, what a phenomenal like life lesson, right? Here I thought I had this whole thing planned out. No. So I jumped over to business school because I thought, well, okay, so I'll just do business and that'll make all kinds of sense. And they were just as linear in their approach to stuff as the engineers were, just coming at it from a different standpoint. And I was literally walking around campus trying to figure out how I was going to tell my parents that I was changing majors again. And I walked into, a, this is like a crazy kismet story, but it's true. I walked into a building I'd never been in before. And there was a visual communications class, in essence, a marketing class going on. And they were presenting to a group of visitors. So, you know, they had contacted a couple of different businesses and they had their leaders come in. And I sat down out in the, in the hallway because I was like, well, what is this? It sounds really interesting. And I sat there for two and a half hours and watched the entire presentation stood up, walked to a phone, called my parents and said, it's called advertising. This thing that brings together like the business and the structure and the, the artistic and the creative and all of that, that thing, it's called advertising. And so like the second that I figured out, you know, how to bring all those interests together, it was like, it was a fast track and I never looked back and I've loved it ever, every day since the scenery changes. There's always something interesting to learn. The dynamic yep. is constantly changing, but it's all built on the same foundation. So the the rudimentary structure of it is always rock solid. The thing that's on top of it is usually a little wiggly. And that's where the fun is, is getting the teams that are in these businesses to understand how to use that foundation to their advantage. But, you know, going back to what you said, this is a problem. And most of the people... 
they really, they don't know what is the distinguish between branding and marketing. What is that? And a lot of them are lost. I am telling you, I talk to everybody and they really don't understand what is actually the branding and marketing. Can you explain a little bit for the listeners that what is the distinguish between two and why people, they're lost? What, what, what's happening? Yeah, you know, I think what's happened is that everybody keeps trying, every generation tries to reinvent everything to make it their own, right? Like if you read your history, you'll see the yeah. same things happening over and over again. So when I was a kid coming up, it was advertising. And then along the way, it became marketing and sales. And then along the way, it became um, branding. And then it became brand identity. And then it became brand strategy. And before you knew it, there was so much vocabulary and everybody was interpreting it the way that they were interpreting it that nobody knew what was going on anymore. So I think about it like this. I think about it like it, I boil it off to marketing. Like if I go into a, a new client presentation and I say, we're a strategic branding agency, what's really funny is they think I'm talking about identity. This has happened over the last four really? years in particular. I'll walk in and I'll say branding and they say, we like our logo. And I'll say, yeah. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not right. talking about your logo. I'm talking about your messaging. <laughs> they say, they say, no, no, no. It's like, it's great. Like, don't touch it. Don't touch it. <laughs> so it's really funny. So, so we started pivoting and, and we've experimented over the last year because it's been a really interesting struggle for, I think a lot of companies that aren't, you know, your Madison Avenue, your Droga, your, you know, DDB need and whatever. Okay. You've been around long enough that people are like, okay, that's, that's advertising in the, in the Mad Men traditional sense. But I think, I think so much of this conversation of vocabulary has changed. At the at the end of the day, your your marketing, which I think is the sort of foundational word that we can all use, is how you represent your value to your potential target audience. That's it. So it, it, you know, boil off all the rest of it. Let's talk about the fact that marketing is how you tell your story and your value to people so that they can understand how you can fit into their world. Uh, and I think that makes it the easiest way possible because you get into the distinction between advertising and branding and strategic marketing and this and that. And people are like, wait, what? They don't have the vocabulary for that. Not because they're dumb, but because no one's consistent with it enough for it to actually matter. Just think about it in terms of message. How are we yeah. conveying our value to a group of people so that they can choose whether they want to be a part of that or not? Yeah, and you know, I, I was talking with a couple of gentlemen yesterday and they really, they can really distinguish between their personal brand and their, their business brand. And the guys, and I told him, I said, you know, the way you say things, the way you act, the way you represent your business, it comes to your personal brand. And what role does your personal brand play in the success of your business? They, they really don't know. Do you think a personal brand like my, like your personal brand, you're in TikTok. I see you. I watch you. I, I really, you know, I know you're a CEO and chief creative officer at the WM Harper, but I, I want to listen to Bill. And then if I need anything, I go to Bill because you have a strong personal brand right now. I just want to know that. What do you think? What is your feedback on the personal brand and your business? The correlation between these two. I think it's changed a lot. And I think the advent of social media is what's made that possible. There was a time when the way that we sold was we have a product or a service or a solution of some kind, and now we're selling it to you. And that was whether it was a personal brand, uh, you know, tick a, tick a Tony Robbins, right? I'm going to help you through your whatever's keeping you stuck, your glass ceiling, and I'm going to show you progress. Or it was uh, a new car or it was, a, you know, an insole that was going to make your shoe feel better, whatever. You make your shoe feel better, make your foot feel better. You don't show it. At any rate, yeah. that was how we used to think about it. People weren't visible back then that way, right? Like if you knew of somebody, it was because there was an article written about them in the media somewhere. I read a magazine article about, um, you know, Alex Boguski, and therefore I know who Alex is. But when social media came along, all of a sudden you and me and the people that weren't famous already or on their way or were or were dedicated to uh, PR in that way and creating a public image, all of a sudden, all of us had an equal share at creating a public image. So companies now, I think, who don't in some way, shape or form put a face 
and a voice to their company are really missing out because we've all become so used to, and the pandemic was a big part of this shift as well. We've all become so used to being able to see and hear and talk and connect with people as a part of our evaluation of whether we think that they're a good match for us. It's kind of like dating. You know, it's like you've got to be able to see this other person, engage with them. It used to be that just the the sort of um, perception or the reputation of a company preceded it. Like, you know, uh, Leo Burnett comes into the room and you're like, okay, Leo Burnett, they've been around for, you know, a million years. And like they, they were here at the foundation of marketing. These guys have been vetted at the highest level. But when you get away from groups that have already achieved that kind of recognition, there's a lot of question about who's there. What do they believe? How do they believe it? Are they just, is it lip service? Are they rubber stamping it? Or are they actually coming in and doing the work? And I think it's hard for people to tell without this kind of communication. So whether it's a personal brand and it's just, you know, hey, I'm Bill and I'm a consultant and I help people sell better, or it's, you know, WMH and it's, you know, we're helping companies get unstuck in terms of their messaging, or it's whatever. I think this one-to-one is a critical component in people feeling like they can be comfortable. I, I have people, it's it's weird, just from this TikTok thing, which is a whole story in and of itself that I've been doing, which has only been for the last four months. I I get people that will call me and they'll be like, oh, oh, I saw you on TikTok. And this like completely <laughs> blows my mind. I'm like, you could have seen me down at the coffee shop yesterday. But for some reason, this this is important. And they're saying, hey, I really like the way that you explained that. Or I really like the way that you believe in this. Would you Would you help me? Because I believe in that too. And so there's like a brand on top of a brand now. So there's the company and the perception and reputation you're creating there. And then there's a level around that, which is what is the leadership team feel and believe about that? And what can you expect from them? And I think a lot of companies are kind of sitting back from that still and they're sort of uncomfortable. Like, well, I'm the CEO of a company and if if I go and I I put myself out there, then they're going to see me as a real human being. But that's what they that's what they are craving. Who is the person behind this? I, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. They're not perfect. So what are we worried about? You know, it's like, let's just go forward. Some people are going to see what I do and I, and I have the hate response on TikTok to to prove it. And they'll be like, ah, you're full of crap. And I'm like, that's okay. My response to them is, listen, you can't please all the people all the time. If you don't believe what I believe, that's okay. The world is full of people who have different opinions. That's what makes it an amazing place to be. If you, however, happen to align with mine, maybe I'm your guy to be able to help you move your business forward. So I think this is a critical component. And I think most companies are just beginning to realize that value. You know, I, I just want to listen and pay attention to you, you just, what you just said about the CEOs and executive to put themselves out there because I yeah. strongly believing and I'm totally in line with you, what you said, because who is behind that company? What is your story? How did the company created it? And a lot of, I think this is the thing, Bill, I'm thinking a lot of CEOs, a lot of executives, they're avoiding that because of the fear of judgment. Ah, because, good point. you know, the fear of judgment. And then you know what they are afraid of judgment? I think because they don't want to be vulnerable. And they think the vulnerability is a sign of their weakness. And I had talked to them. I said, no, it's not. Just go there. They're going to judge you. As you said, you're going to have a negative feedback on TikTok. They're going to judge you no matter what. It, yeah. it doesn't matter what you do. But if you don't go out there, you don't tell what you believe. And most importantly, as you said, what is your story? How to get here? Then, not gonna happen. You can't be in the shadows and operate in shadows. I think that the fear of judgment. Have you ever afraid of the judgment yourself? Oh sure. <laughs> in fact, oh yeah, well, sure, lots. Yeah, sure. I don't. Th- I think the day that you, I think it's it's like there's a saying in theater: the day you're not nervous to walk out on stage is the day you need to quit theater because you don't care anymore. And I think that that's true here too. I also think. Uh, you know, one of the things that I've heard a lot of response from people about is I love your energy. And I really wanted yeah. to kind of think about that for a second because I'm like, what does that really mean? And here's what I here's what I've kind of come to. I remember reading a study back in uh, in college that said that 
people fear public speaking over death. Wow. This was an amazing thing, right? Like if you really think about that, people are so afraid about that that notion of putting themselves out there, being seen. And a lot of our a lot of our society is that way, you know, be humble, don't be too proud, like, you know, th- so there's a lot of contextual thing about that. But then the pandemic comes along, and I remember I've got a good friend um who who runs a company that helps primarily leadership, CEO, C-suite learn how to convey better on camera. And I called her and I said, I, I, I'm a theater guy. Like if I don't have people that I'm looking at, I can't, I can't connect with them. Like I'm, I'm my, okay, here's funny story. So my father was a disc jockey his whole life. So he sat oh. in front of a microphone and talked into a microphone. Every time I walked into that room, I'd freeze. And my father couldn't stand being in front of people and being in front of people because of my theater background was as natural for me as breathing. Like I have no problem getting up in front of 10,000 people and being like, Hey, how are you? Let's talk about something today. And everybody will learn something totally comfortable for me. For my father, that was like the worst thing ever. Wow. But I would sit down in front of the microphone and he'd be like, Hey, come on in and we'll have a, you know, I'll, I'll bring you in on this segment. And I was like, uh, and he, he said, how is it that you can stand in front of people and you're not at all worried about it? And then I put you in a room in front of a microphone and you freak out. And I said, because I can't see my audience. So I think that there are a number of different things. So I called Karen, this friend of mine, when pandemic hit. And I said, I really need to start putting a face on the agency. But every time I, that little green light goes on, like I, I, like I, I feel so uncomfortable. And she, you know, just laughed. And she said, so many people feel that way. So many people. And she said, whether it's talking to, you know, a piece of plastic or it's talking to a bunch of people, for whatever reason, they've built that barrier up inside of them so much that it becomes a true fear. Um, and it, it just took me doing it a little bit to go, oh, this is just like talking in front of a live audience. It's just I have to make up the audience in my head. Once I got to that place, then this became very comfortable, but it wasn't, it wasn't at all in the beginning. And I think it's not for a lot of people in the beginning. Yeah. And that's, that's, you know, that's a great question that is this the way that people, they can differentiate themselves from the crowd? Is this the way they have to be more open? They have to be more like a responsive. Do you think what is, what, what ways people, they can differentiate themselves, like especially the entrepreneurs these days, the founders, the CEO, because you got to have a differentiation point. I think people try to do two things, um, badly. The first is they try to be too many things to too many people. Yep. And the second is that they're terrified to take a stand. Um, and so, you know, this, this works in brand messaging as well for businesses because it's all the same thing. The structure of how we market and message is the same, whether it's uh, a door-to-door salesman or it's a Fortune 500 company. We're still, we're still expressing our messages the same way, which is to say what it is that you stand for has to be clear. In order for a brand to have any value, it's got to stand for something. People move toward pleasure or opportunity and they move away from discomfort or um, pain, right? So we're kind of like plants. We lean to the light. So the more a company is able to say, this is the enemy so that we can be the hero, the better. No Darth Vader, no Luke Skywalker. Luke Skywalker is just a boring farmer until Darth Vader comes in and starts mucking everything up. And now all of a sudden he's got a passionate cause that he's for. That's the same way that the great stories are told. These companies that are like, you know what? We're against X, whatever X is, you know, Volvo is against um, unsafe. Like they're a brand that's all for safety. And Porsche is all about performance. They want, you know, the performance people. And Prius is for people that want to save the world one gas tank at a time. But by, by identifying this one thing that they stand for, people go, oh, hey, those are the those are the performance people or those are the safety people or whatever. And then they can opt in. That shortens that sales cycle significantly because people get it, they remember it, they can tell their friends about it, and they can choose whether they're a good match for them very simply. So I think in terms of branding, when 
people go out and see, now I just did it. I called it branding. When people are going out <laughs> and doing the marketing and they're trying to talk about it, I think they try to be too many things. Well, I'm this, but I'm also this, but I'm also that, but I'm also this. And people go, I don't, I, I don't know what you're standing for. So that's too hard. I've got too much other things to consider. I'll go find somebody that's simpler. Um, and I don't think that they're willing to talk about what they don't like. I think they're trying to be nice, nice to everything. And you can't do that. You can't stand for something if you don't stand against something. And so what they do in absence of that is they talk about things like features and benefits. Okay. So here it is. And do you see this little door? Well, we have a door like none other. And then we have this little button on the back. Nobody cares about that stuff. What do you stand for? You know, uh, Nike releases people's inner athlete. They're selling progress. Yep. Yes. I want progress. Like put me in on that list. I think when people get that structure, it makes them incredibly powerful. Basically, what are you telling me? The product is not as important as your what you stand for. What you right? stand for, in my experience, is the only thing that matters. After that comes experience with the product, et cetera, et cetera. But what you stand for and the ability for people to see it coming is important. I use James Bond all the time because everybody knows the character, right? If James Bond, well, let's think about James Bond. James Bond is always athletically fit. He's always, you know. Sharp looking. Mother, mother country first, right? Always super smart, always gadgets, always shaken, not stirred, always well-dressed, always capable in any situation, right? That's the character. If James Bond walked on screen 50 pounds overweight, wearing a Hawaiian shirt with an umbrella drink and some fruit juice in it, balding with like little Bahama socks on, nobody would believe it was James Bond because that's not the character. Setting that expectation set is a critical part of successful branding, whether you're a person who's branding or you're a business that's branding. What is that unique experience that I'm going to have? He's not the only super, you know, spy that exists in the world, but we know him and love that character because it's been clearly defined. He's consistent. We always get from that character what we expect. And that's what makes that reputation so strong. Companies that constantly pivot, they might as well just be parody products because they're like, well, we're this this week and then we're that that week. And the consuming audience is like, wait, who are you this week? Like it doesn't make any sense to them. So that consistency and building that reputation and standing for something, in my opinion, that's where that's where a lot of the the traction comes from. Now, if you ask their internal team, they'll say, "Oh, it's a it's innovation. Innovation's fleeting. It doesn't matter what tech you've created. Someone's going to copy it in five minutes. You know, Porsche is a yeah. car. Mercedes is a car. You know, whatever Volvo is a car. But because they've eked out these things they stand for." they become the beacons of that thing. You know, if, if you're a person that prizes safety first and you're buying a new car, you're going to be at Volvo at some point, most likely, because they've worked so hard to attach that one idea to their company. I think people miss the simplicity. They try to make it, you know, oh, well, don't forget, I'm also this and this. No, 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 that comes later. What's the thing people can get excited about? People buy emotionally and then justify logically, and companies think it's the other way around. People think, if I show them all the logical reasons that I'm good, then they'll get emotional about it. No, that's not how we work as people. As people, we walk into a room and we see the pretty girl across the room and we go, oh, wow. And we get emotionally engaged. As ridiculous of an example as that is, that's how people are. A Harley Davidson goes down the street and we yep. all turn our head and go, oh man, wouldn't it be amazing? That's an emotional response, not a logical one. Then we you know, come along behind it and do the logic stuff. I don't know. You watched the movie, The Lamborghini. I was I watched that movie, and hey. that's what I just had a flashback. That one scene they were talking the Lamborghini and Ferrari, and I'm, I totally agree with you. It was all about what he was standing for, like his where was his vision and what he believed. And I think the problem that we facing right now, I see it every day when I talk to the people. The people themselves or that individual doesn't know what he or she wants or where he's going to go, what he believes. And therefore, that will 
affect their business because the business would be lost as well. If, if I don't know what I'm standing for, what I believe to do, my company is not going to do that. What, what do you think yeah. about that? I think that's absolutely true. And I think that's why so many leadership teams struggle. I think the picture, and, and I say this because I've failed at this more times than I can count. The picture in my head is so clear. Yep. This is what we believe in. Uh, you know, this is where we're going. This is what it's going to look like when it's finished. When the painting's finished, I already have it in my head. Now I have to relay it to the people that are working with me. Do they value it the same way I do? Do they see it the same way I do? If you think about the way businesses grow, you understand where that falls apart. So I start a business, yep. right? Everybody tells me I'm nuts. So I just left a job, probably. I don't have any money. I'm, I'm following this dream. So I'm going to build my mousetrap, right? So it's okay. So I'm building my mousetrap. I build it. I build it. I build it. Okay. Now I'm trying to sell my mousetrap and I run into a limit on my time because I've only got 24 hours in a day. So when I get so busy, I can't do anything. I hire, I go, Hey, you come here, come here, come here. You build this, just build that for me. Okay. Don't worry about where we're going. Just make this. Now think about it again and again and again and again. And everybody's like running, 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 trying to build. They got to stop and say, wait a second. Does everybody understand why we're doing this? Because if you don't understand why, and if it's not something that you believe in, you're never, ever going to get people. Like I I talked to CEOs that like, why don't people care? They don't care because number one, it's not their vision. It's yours. Number two, you didn't share it enough with them so that they can see their role in it. Three, you're making it all about you. Now we've got to turn it around and make it about them. How can they see that they're getting their vision while you're getting your vision? The conclusion on this I've come to is that it's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about me. The only way that we ever reach our vision is by making it possible for everybody else to reach theirs. As a business owner, I can do that because I can say, you, copywriter, What you want more than anything in the world is to write amazing copy. You care about it and you want it. So my job is to make sure that you have an opportunity to do the thing you love. Then I go to the next person and I say, you salesperson, what you love is going and hunting deer and bringing it back to to the tribe to eat, right? So I want to give you the best thing possible. Look at this amazing copywriter. Look at this amazing work that they're doing. You can sell this idea and this work you got the sharpest spear I can give you. Go get all the deer you can. And then they go and they're excited and person and person and person and person. But that's not a part of American business culture primarily. Unfortunately, yeah. No, primarily it's make money, get big, burn people out because you're trying to hurry up and hit your goals, whatever. It's, it's very, I mean, they're literally setting themselves up for mediocrity and they don't know. And that's, that's what's so funny about this is that people are so reticent to change. I've forgotten what the term is for it. Um, I, it's like, uh, it's like the theory of confirmation bias, but that's not it. And I'm never going to remember it during this interview, but the basic idea is it's physics. An object in motion will stay in motion absent something to force it to change its direction. That's how people are too. If they are bent on doing something, even if they say, we're not getting enough sales, we're not we're not growing the way that we want, you come into that environment and try to change them, your story had better be rock solid in order to change that behavior. I can't tell you the number of clients that I have come across over the last 30 years that say, I know you're right and I know that what you're saying is going to help us, but I just, I'm not willing to change what we're doing. And there's no sense in chasing those people because they, until they learn to let go of the vine, that you, you're you never, ever going to change them and they'll never benefit from what you're doing. We had a client that did this about a month ago. They knew that they were in trouble. They asked us to come in. We came in. We did all the strategic work. We told them exactly what they had to do and they just can't do it. They can't let go. So... At some point, you know, I used to, when I was younger in my career, I'd get really fiery about it, right? I'd be like, how can you not see it? (laughs) But that, of course, does absolutely nothing but make everybody angry. At this point, you know, it's, here it is. 
It's been explained as many times as it can be explained, as many different people explaining it, because we all have to hear it how we have to hear it before it makes sense. When you see it for yourself, call me. When you're ready, then let's talk. And sometimes it's two years, and sometimes it's five years, and sometimes it's never, and sometimes it's six weeks. And somebody comes away, oh, I talked to this person. I saw this video. I read this book. Did you mean this? Yes. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I want it. I want it. I want it. But until they have that moment, it doesn't matter how great what we're saying is. We have to be able to break that momentum. Human behavior and and the consistency of direction is is something that most businesses just don't even talk about. But it's a very, very real thing as it relates to how you can change the trajectory of a business. And you are right. You can't be everything to everybody. We had a client's yep like a, last week, and he said, I want to lay off all my marketing people and you guys, you are digital marketing and I want you to, he sent me, I swear to God, 24 pages of what they are doing. I said, and I sent him an email. I said, listen there, you know, we we do what we're good at it. And I want to tell you, this is exactly bullet point. I said, we can do this, we can do this, we can do this. This is out of my league. I, I'm not going to do it. I, this is not what I do. And yeah. I cannot just go out of my way and say, I want to create this for one club. I can't do it. And, you know, they said they're going to get back to us, but you you have to stay in line. I, I understand that. It's, sometimes it's hard to let it go because you want to do that. You want to get that class. You want, oh, I can do it. I can. Yeah, no, it's, no, 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 hard. No, no. it's hard. It's hard. It's, it's really hard. But going back to, you know, you said that the people and, you know, they believe what you believe and, I, I think you are a you are a person that you will never sacrifice your people for the numbers. I would never do that. You know, my people are so important because I believe that if you train them well, they believe what you believe and you give them the right tools and they can go to war and they can make things happen. By saying that, what do you think about these new things, the AI that is going around? And do you think this Every day, Bill, this TikTok talks about chat GPT. <laughs> Do you well, think let me, let me go back because there's, yeah. there's a bigger storm that's happening here, in my opinion. What is that? Uh, so when the pandemic hit, the worst side of a big corporate business showed its face. They fired everybody. Yep. You remember that? So yes. the pandemic came. So I want to I want to talk about this from 30,000 feet, and then I want to yep. drop down into the perception of both sides of, of this equation. So yeah. <laughs> everything is going along, going along, going along. Boom. Pandemic hits. The new religion of business is protect the bottom line, no matter what. So what did they do? They fired everybody that they didn't need, leaned out the teams, fired people. People were furious. Where's the loyalty? Where's the respect? We would have taken a pay cut if we could all share in the in the hardship together. That's what we did at our company. When things we got tough, too. we did we reduced salaries by 25% and everybody shared in the hardship. That way nobody had to lose their job. That way nobody, you know, we uh, were people uncomfortable? Yeah, we were uncomfortable. Yeah. We took the biggest hit. But at the end of the day, we made sure nobody was just fired outright. Okay, so that happens, right? Now everybody's furious pissed off eight ways from Sunday. Then there's that little glimmer. You remember where we're all coming back to work and everybody starts hiring everybody. Well, now yeah. the workers ticked off. So the worker says, I used to be 80,000. Now I'm 120,000 or screw you. So big corporate America who could actually stroke those checks gathered everybody up and paid them an obscene amount of money. This gave everybody else the opinion that they were worth an inflated thing too. Small businesses and medium-sized businesses like ours got hit hardest on that because we couldn't compete with paying 150%, 130% of salaries just because the big guys were like, well, we screwed up. But if you think about it in terms of loss, the amount of money we saved by firing everybody then lets us hire these people at this expanded rate. But then, but then... They fired him again. Like it wasn't yeah. bad. So the great migration happens. Everybody's like, well, I'm not going to stay at my job because I can get twice what I was making down the street. You're okay. Right. You're right. So now there's no loyalty on both sides, right? Now that now the now the the uh employee is going and the 
people in the thing are going like this. And everybody's like, well, I'm going to fire you and I'm going to hire you and this and that. Everybody moves, 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 moves. Then they land and they're like, whoa, I showed the world. Look at my fat, happy new paycheck. Six months, nine months later, they're firing everybody all over again. And then, and then, because it wasn't dumb enough, then AI comes into the picture. My best definition that I've heard for AI is a mouth <laughs> without a brain. I love this definition. <laughs> a mouth without a brain, because that's exactly what it is. Garbage in, oh garbage God. out. I so, love that. So it's like, you know, now we've got a bunch of, I'm just going to call them idiots, up at the top of some of these businesses <laughs> that go, Oh, I'm going to fire everybody and I'm going to use AI Ooh, the money I'm going to make. And I'm going, yep. you're an idiot because the, as, as amazing as the tool is, and it is some of the things that I've seen come out of like the photo generation and the, the ability to say, you know, I want, you know, using this as a reference and using this lens you know, like you could prompt it to do amazing things if you have the idea and the education to do it. Otherwise, no, right. I said a thing. I said a thing yesterday. I said, I said, explain the value of branding as if you were Snoop Dogg. I posted this on LinkedIn yesterday. It was hysterical. It sounded like something that might maybe come out of his mouth. Maybe. I mean, I don't know the man, but it might maybe come out and it certainly like tried to draw on his thing. And it was in fact an explanation and a not half bad one about the general benefit of marketing, branding in this instance, said through Snoop Dogg's words. I posted, I got a bunch of funny responses back. People were like, that's a, that's a funny, you know, that's almost as good as Martha Stewart and Snoop Dogg. You remember that commercial selling stuff. Yeah. And I was like, well, it's just, Okay. But you have to have the idea. What is it that you're asking AI to do? Why are you asking it to do it? What is it What is it you stand for? How are you supporting what you're standing for? Where is the original idea? This is going to be, and I'm really excited about it. I made a post about this on TikTok and people really misunderstood it. It was funny. I got a couple of people uh, replying back that were like, your humor on this, you like your sarcasm is <laughs> way over people's heads. They think you're serious. Because I was like, here's a message to all of my clients, competitors, please go fire everybody and use AI. Do it as fast as possible. Please be dumb and keep being dumb because what's AI draws off the same pool of information. If you don't guide and direct and course correct it, everybody that does this query is going to get in essence, the exact same answer. Everything is going to become parody like that. And nobody yeah. realizes it. Guys like us are going to clean up because original thought, the value of original thought and ideology is going to go up there. Everybody else is going to be like, oh, I don't know. I need a paper on uh, such and such so-and-so and the so-and-so of such and such from 1904 to 1999. Click. And it's going to spit out a five-page paper and they're going to go, here you go. And they will have learned nothing. They will have achieved nothing. And that laziness is going to go like a rocket ship to the moon. Is it wireless? And people are yep. going to tell themselves, look how much we accomplished and it didn't cost us anything. And they're going to believe it. They're going to believe it. And there's not going to be a single original thought in there because guess what? AI isn't there yet. And maybe one day it will be. Maybe one day you can put enough in there to be able to say, if I feed you this piece of information and that piece of information and I come at it from this angle, what can you come together and see that I can? I, where it has been successful is in chess moves. Um, I remember reading a story about a chess master that played the computer and basically said, I'm never ever going to be able to beat this thing, not because it's a better chess player than I am, but because it thinks of combinations no one has thought of yet. And the reason it's doing it is because it's extrapolating off of millions of games that it's been able to do. But for a lot of this theoretical thing that this that the people are asking it to do, like write my write my introduction emails, write me five hundred introduction emails for my business. They're they're awful. They're just awful yet because they don't have any of the. They have none of the qualifiers that we do in our head that say, well, that's a good idea. That's a bad idea. That sounds like everybody else. 
None of that exists within the AI brain yet or the AI experience. So do I think it's going to be a positive, powerful tool? Yeah. Do I think it can even be a powerful, positive tool now? Yes. But is it there? Are you, you know, so I think, I think yeah. a lot of businesses are going to try to lean on that and they're just going to anger the talent pool all over again, which is going to make it really, really hard for anybody to do business with people because they're not going to have any faith or trust in anything or anyone. You know, when I was coming up, there were people that had been in the business 50 years. Like you chose your agency and you were a lifer there. The guy that taught me had been in that company for 50 years. Find me somebody that's been in a company five years now. Like it just, yeah. I don't know. It's it's eroding. You know, you know, I had a, I had a, it's eroding. I had, sorry for it. I had a guy that yesterday he said, yeah, I have two writers. I'm going to let them go and I want to use the AI, you know, and I have my, my, you know, my executive assistant kid. I said, are you, are you stupid? What yeah. are you thinking? You can't have the original ideas when you guys are talking, you're going to give it to, and I was just, he said, no, you don't know how much I save, you know, it's just, I save like a 10 grand a month. And and I, I didn't know what to say. As you said, people are getting that thing. When the guy goes on the TikTok and he says, I just made $60,000 on the, you know, chat GPD. I put all this and I sold it. Some people, as you said, they're going to believe it. <laughs> there are a lot of people that aren't sophisticated enough. And by that, what I mean is not that they're, that they that are simple or something like that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that they haven't experienced this enough that they understand what's going to happen. So yeah, if I'm, if I'm a solopreneur or if I'm a three person business or a 10 person business and I don't realize that the quality level is critical to my success and all I'm thinking about is the bottom line, then yeah, I'm going to make some really dumb decisions. And I think that's why those emails that we all like joke about, you know, like I get 50 new business emails a day. It's like, good God, I hate lead gen. But there are so many companies and there's a brand new set of them every day, every year, there's a brand new set of people that say, forget it, corporate America, I'm going out on my own, or I just graduated college, or I just got into America and I'm starting my business. And they see these things and they they don't see them for what they are. They go, oh my gosh, those guys are going to get me money? Oh yeah, I'm going to pay them right now. And those guys are going to write me emails? Oh my gosh, I need that right now. And they'll shell out that money and it becomes a volume game. So if I'm getting $2,000 a month from, you know, 50,000 businesses, guess what? I'm doing real good, but it's garbage. And everybody's getting the same thing, but they don't know it. Business A doesn't talk to business B, so they have no idea that they're getting the same thing. And so they, you know, so they're like, well, they're hammering on their sales team, go sell more. And what does the sales team have to say in you're response? Do, yeah. Give me something innovative that I can go sell. And the cycle continues and continues and continues. So, you know, it, I think going all the way back to your point about what do you stand for and knowing what you stand for, just like I would not lay people off, I would protect the team as long as humanly possible before something had yep. to happen. The thing that I think a lot of businesses kind of miss is you got to you got to have principles. Like don't just take the cheap easy way out. Yeah, it might take a little longer, but there is no shortcut to being Arnold Schwarzenegger. You got to be in the gym every day. You can't cheat. Every I'm sorry, you know what I'm dating myself. Maybe I should say Dwayne the Rock Johnson. People would actually know who that is. Yeah, Arnold, yeah. Arnold's getting a little long in the tooth now. So maybe maybe we should say that, but it doesn't matter. There's no shortcut to that. You have to do it slowly. You have to build and it has to be meaningful what you're building. And I think people are just so desperate for shortcuts and they they tell themselves silly things like, well, this is technology and this is going to be a huge advantage. But if you don't have somebody that's running it right, it's like the old data, you know, thing, garbage in, garbage out. You're just going to get junk. And it's all about the consistency, as you said, you know, yeah. I always say, do you want to pay the price for consistency, which is an ounce, or do you want to pay the price for the regret, which is by the yeah. pound? That's, you know, that, is <laughs> which it, I've one? forgotten who it was that said it last. I think it was Will Smith in his book was talking about there's only two kinds of regret, right? The regret yeah. of doing it or the regret of the pain that, you know, that you feel from having not done it. Like you're yeah. either going to feel the pain of doing the thing or you're going to feel the regret of not doing it. Which one do you happen to choose? Do you want to sit around every day thinking, 
"Ah, I should have gone to the gym or do you just want to get up and go to the gym? You're going to feel pain either way. Which pain do you choose? The the price of regret is so high, but with all we said, you know, uh, I just want to ask you, do you have any advice for entrepreneurs, for executives, solo panelists, they really going to market and they're going to brand themselves or their company. Do you have any advice? You know, they just want to start it. They want to do that. It's a clean, like a clean platform. What they have to do before they get, I call it contaminated. <laughs> ah, ah, oh, I like contaminated. Um, I think the, the best place that I can think to start is don't make any assumptions. Ask people. So you're going to have a premise about why you're doing something. Get confirmation on that. Research is skipped over so frequently. It's like, well, I know I, uh, how many customers or clients have you had? Where they say, well, I know our, I know our customer. And you go, oh yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll yeah. It, 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 assumptions, assumptions on top of assumptions on top of assumptions. And you're probably missing something really valuable there. And you can only stand for one thing for all of you old Billy Crystal movie people, city slickers, you know, curly, you can only stand for one thing. So what is that thing going to be? Then everything else comes underneath that. So your big idea is the thing you stand for. And then the ways you do it are what come underneath that. But, you know, if I'm Nike and I'm releasing people's inner athlete, or if I'm Dollar Shave Coke, because everybody gets mad at me for using Nike. They're like, Nike's huge and they've done it forever. I was like, yeah, yeah, but they started out of the trunk of a car. So let's not, you know, let's not forget that they went through it too. Dollar Shave Club came out and had one idea. Don't be duped. That was the <laughs> idea. Don't pay <laughs> $15 for something that should cost you a buck. Don't be a schmuck. Don't be an idiot. Buy this thing. It works just as well. And you, you're paying for stuff you don't know. I thought that was such a brilliant line. Why are you paying for shave tech you don't need? I remember seeing that line the first time and I was like, everybody else is going to think about how funny this is. Strategy was rock solid. Yeah. Don't pay for shave tech you don't need. Do you need laser guided missiles and a shit? I was like, come on, man. This guy knew his audience because my dad, if my dad had still been alive when Dollar Shave... <laughs> came out, my father would have just been, where's the lifetime button? Like my dad would have gone right over <laughs> trial and he'd have been like, you guys get squeezing a penny. That That's my brand, man. That's my guy right there. And that was the thing. You've got some people that are like all about high tech and you've got some people that are like, I'm saving money and being pragmatic. This is the Porsche Prius thing, right? All over again. So it's like these people that want Porsche, man, you're not going to talk about a Porsche. I'm a Porsche guy. You're never going to give me an appraise. Never. Not my mom owes yeah. appraise. I laugh. I'm like, this is the worst driving experience ever on the face of the planet. She gets in a Porsche. She's like, this is the worst extravagance ever. Our values are so different in this respect. But the people that value the thing that they do, they're going to love you for standing for that one thing. So going back to that question that you asked, know what that one thing is and make sure that it's, that it's, it's tension. Make sure that there's some tension. Don't stand for, we had a hospital client one time whose tagline was in love with life, a hospital. Well, <laughs> I, hope you, I would hope you would be in love with life. Like that is the most false positive tagline that's ever been developed ever, maybe in the history of our oh We're in love with life. Hot diggity whoopty. Do you think anybody inside the leadership team had a problem with that? No. You want to talk about a false positive you're a hospital. You're supposed to be in love with life. <laughs> now say something meaningful. But leadership teams don't see that. So they're, you know, they tell themselves things like, well, that's a good position to have. Nobody will get upset with that. If you're not making people upset with your stance or passionate about your stance, your marketing is failing you. Period. So go out and have an opinion and stand strong for that opinion. Because that's what people are looking for. What is it you stand for? You're not going to get everybody. So stop telling yourself, well, everybody wears shoes, so our audience is everybody. What garbage? What kind of shoe? Because the person that wears, you know, a Prada shoe, forgotten what the name of the shoe is with the red bottom that everybody gets so excited about. I'm not oh. a shoe guy. So, um, you know, the person that buys that shoe for $1,000 a pair or whatever it is, 
and the person that buys like, you know, hush puppies, like those are two totally now both of them are wearing shoes, but the person that bought the one over here is never going to buy the product over here. Know your audience, figure them out and then position yourself accordingly. That's the best advice I think anybody, personal brand or business can have as they start. Don't just focus on the mousetrap and don't believe that you can be all things to all people. Man, great advice. I really want to talk to you all day because it's so fascinating that, you know, I love your feedback, your honesty, your transparency, and you say it exactly like what it is. But I just want to tell my listeners, guys, if you need any help, like, you know, you really get into the, you know, the, the backbone of the branding, you got to talk to Bill. <laughs> oh, thank you. I appreciate it. It's, it's, it's fun and is, is, is very like educational. You know, we all got a lot of education out of this, especially myself. You know, I always learn. And thank you. Thank you, Bill. Thank you for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, you have created an amazing agency and your TikTok is blowing up. I love that. I'm watching oh, well, you every thank day. thank you very much. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thanks so much for the opportunity to come on and talk with you today. I really enjoyed it. I look forward to talking again soon. Thank you so much, Bill. You have a wonderful day, my friend. Thank you. And you. Thank you.